If you grew up in church, you probably remember the wonderful stories of your Sunday school teachers that, uh, from the Bible that they told you. Uh, there's God creating the world. There's Noah in the ark. There's uh, David and Goliath, um, Jonah and the whale, among others. And the thing about these is that we tend to see these biblical events as merely children's stories. Uh, we think of them as kind of cute, simple, fun. Well, in this sermon series, I want to reclaim these stories as more than just cute, innocent children's stories. They're in the Bible, and the authors put them there for a reason. And when we actually read these parts of the Bible, we find there's a lot more there than maybe we knew as children, and that they aren't just cute little Sunday school stories, but they are narratives full of much more than we often hear. We have much to learn from them, even as adults. And we begin this morning with the story of creation. Most Sunday school curriculums begin here. You know, the fall starts. Mom and dad want to get off to a good start. We bring the kids to Sunday school. Everybody hears this story. Uh, as we learn, God created the sky, the plants, the animals, and us. Isn't that lovely? But as we get older, we learn about science. Many people pit the story of creation in Genesis against uh, scientific discovery, and the result can be discounting Genesis and skepticism about anything in the Bible. We've sometimes kept a children's understanding, and we haven't matured as Bible readers. And thus, we've read these stories in adults, and we either keep a very simplistic understanding while ignoring the real questions that we might have when we read some of these things, or we kind of shove it all in a drawer and we just dismiss them all together. I want to try to help us read Genesis 1 and 2 particularly with some maturity of faith. In the beginning, God. And so starts the story of the whole Bible. Now, there are all kinds of questions that come when interpreting Genesis 1 and 2. Many of the problems that Bible readers encounter come from a very wooden, very literal reading of this part of the Bible. You read Genesis 1 and 2 very carefully, and there's probably, some people think, there's probably not just one, but two creation accounts here. There's one in Genesis 1 that we kind of heard this morning, and then it seems like another one begins in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, and they vary just a bit. For example, they are both different in terms of the order of appearance of plants and humans. They, they read differently, so they both can't be literally correct. So what are they telling us? I don't know that we can ever precisely know what is intended by every verse and every detail of this creation story. And you can find plenty of places that are going to debate the multitude of issues that people can find in these chapters. What I want to focus on this morning is what we can know. What are the most, what are the claims of these creation accounts making? What does it tell us about the world, about us, and most of all, what does it tell us about God? Sometimes we get lost in the trees. We lose the sense of the forest. And in all faithful reading of the Bible, whatever we're reading in the Bible, whether Genesis or other parts, we always have to ask ourselves, what did the original author, the person, or the persons who wrote this many centuries ago, what did... What did they want to convey? The best meaning of any passage in the Bible comes from what the author intended. And whoever wrote this may have had, probably did have, very different concerns from those of us who live in the 21st, Western, 21st century Western scientific world. In order to get what the original author meant, we have to try to understand the language, the culture of the author. We can't just put it in our language and culture and assume that we're going to have the correct meaning all the way around. We also need to try to understand how the original hearers of this story heard these things. Their concerns and their questions may not be our concerns and our questions. 
Our task is to find our place in God's story, and it is God's story. He has stirred the writing of these things so that we can know him and be in relationship with him. In the beginning, God. Have you ever thought about just those words? It's not the beginning of God. So what is the author telling us? Is the author telling us that this is the beginning of time and history? Or is it a more scientific beginning, like the beginning of the physical universe? Or is it just the beginning of a larger story that's going to continue as we read the Bible? Is it the beginning of our human race? The beginning of what? All those things? And that phrase, in the beginning, could easily be translated in the language it's written in, when God began to create. A few Bibles read like that. Maybe yours does. As a matter of fact, the Jewish Bible reads like that. That's how Jews read that. If we read that first verse like that, when God began to create, it suggests that God's creating the world just wasn't just a one-time, one-and-done thing, but something that is, God is always at work doing. But this is the beginning. That Hebrew word for create in the Bible, it's only ever applied to God. Only God creates. And it's never used to refer to the creating of materials. In the creation story, manufacturing of things is not the issue. The issue is the organization of these materials. God is assigning roles and functions to the various parts of the creation. The point isn't that God is creating light or water or plants. The point is how God makes them function, their purpose in this world. Now, interpretation of this passage in our times have often told us that what's important is the origin of the matter, of the stuff. But that doesn't seem to be the concern of the writer of Genesis. There were other ancient stories about creation circulating in the ancient Near East. Other cultures, other religions had their stories. And if you compare the account of the Bible with some of these stories, boy, there's a big difference about how they see the world, how they see whoever made the world. For example, one of the most popular creation stories in the ancient world was that people were created from the spilled out guts of a god who had been in battle with another god. What does that say about humans? In other creation stories, there's struggles of power and manipulation and deception to control. Not in the story of Israel's God. Uh-uh. Israel would have heard these stories. They could have adopted them. But in Genesis 1 and 2, we find what we read there contradicts many of these stories. There are no other gods. The world is ordered by one God. And it's not out of a power struggle. And humans are created in the image of God. Not out of the killing of another God. Second thing I want to say, Genesis 1 and 2, God also isn't in his creation, but he stands apart from it. God isn't the wind, God isn't the skies, God isn't in the trees. He, he created it. He stands apart from it. That's why we're not pantheists. Do you know what pantheism is? Pantheism is the worship of the creation. Pantheists believe God's or God is in all the stuff. But, but not in the story of Genesis. He is the creator. Other things are not him, and therefore they are not to be worshipped. And humans are the highest point of his creation, which we'll get back to in a moment, okay? In the creation story, over and over again, God says, let there be, let there be. We, there's a pattern, there's an order to this, isn't there? And God brings into existence a creation. And this creation is characterized by precision, by order, and harmony. And God speaks this into being. Genesis 1, 2 tells us that the earth was formless, it was empty. And what follows is God bringing form and content and order to everything. When God speaks the light into being, he identifies the light and the darkness. From this, evening and morning come. What's this about? Well, God is setting time in motion. 
God sets up the climate. He is responsible for providing the availability of water and the availability of the land to grow vegetation. He's responsible for this. Um, it doesn't talk about the creation of the land, although we know he did that. It talks about what that land does. And God orders the laws of agriculture in the seasonal cycles. Everything is created with a role to play. All of it ordered by God and called good. God is not a tyrant, and the world is not some threatening thing, as in some of the other stories that were in the ancient Near East at that time. Now, in our century, in our time, the debate of evolution and creation came to be. You know, it wasn't always like that. That's a, that's a pretty new debate. And it's led to a big discussion about science and faith, and we often get stuck right there. And too often we've allowed the creation-evolution debate to be staged as if that's the main issue and if the origin of things is the main issue in this story. When we should rather focus on the meaning and the purpose of the things in our world and what our purpose and existence is as human beings. What is this telling us? And without going into faith-science conversation, that faith for science conversation, let's understand that while evolution can explain how things evolve, it can't explain their purpose. It might be able to explain how people have adapted over a great deal of time, but it can't give a reason for why we're here or why we were created. And the issue in Genesis isn't the specifics of the theory of evolution. In Genesis, the issue is that life is not the result of impersonal forces, but rather the result of a personal God. And this God had purpose and value to what he designed. Our modern reading of Genesis often asks the wrong questions. We ask scientific questions. We're scientific people. We live in a scientific age. It is vastly different from the world in which the writer of Genesis lived. We know more scientifically speaking, but the story in Genesis may very well not be addressing those scientific questions at all. Doesn't mean science and faith don't have anything to do with one another, or that there's not harmony between the Bible and science. They just address different parts of our world. Stephen Jay Gould was a, a great scientist, very well-known respected scientist. He was also not a person of faith, but he said this, no scientific theory, including evolution, can pose any threat to religion. For these two great tools of human understanding operate in complementary, not contrary, in complementary fashion in their totally separate realms. Science operates as an inquiry about the factual state of the natural world. Religion operates as a search for spiritual meaning and ethical values. Again, the, the purpose of the story of creation is to say that the one God has ordered and, and this world and made it function. And everything goes back to him, that creation has a purpose, and the sovereign God, the one Lord, God, is over it all. Think of it like this. If, if we were going to talk about someone building a computer, we wouldn't talk about how the screen was manufactured. We wouldn't talk about who made the keyboard. We wouldn't talk about how the chips are made. We would be talking about how all the parts are assembled so that the computer could operate. Uh, the building of the computer would begin with scattered pieces all over the table, uh, and the builder would put together the motherboard so that the chip would make the computer run fast and efficiently, which is its purpose. And, and the maker of the computer would put in the hard drive to organize all the data. That's the purpose of the hard drive. And, and the builder would put in the operating system, install it to integrate all the functions of the computer. The purpose of the operating system is that, and so forth. The point is the functioning of the computer when we say, how does this computer build? Here's another way to look at the creation story. If we went to the Hale Theater to a show and we came to the play late and we sat down and we asked the person next to us, hey, how did this, how did this begin? 
we would not want to know the explanation of the idea of the playwright to write this production. We wouldn't want to know how the set was put together. We wouldn't know, want to know how the cast was chosen. Granted, those are parts of the beginning of the play. What we want to know is what happened in the beginning. Uh, how did this story go? So with our reading of Genesis, we have to be at, careful what we're asking when we read it. Scripture isn't in, is interested in the set, in the cast, in the script. It's interested in the play itself, the story, and that God is the link between the two. One final illustration. If someone asked us where we live, we could tell the story of how our house was built, the foundation, the roof, the electricity, the plumbing. We could describe the details of how things were made and the manufacturing of those things. But this probably isn't what we're interested or what the person is interested in. Unless you're Dale Broughton, you're not interested in any of that, okay? <laughs> That's not what you're asking. What people are more interested in is how have you made this a home? Tell us about your house. How have we furnished the home? How have we decorated it? What, what rooms function in what way? How have we put the home together? Now both the house story and the home story are creation stories to be sure, but people are usually more interested in the furnishing, the decor, how the home was put together. Genesis is about furnishing the home, not manufacturing the furniture. But above and beyond all the stuff that is in this world, this is a story about God and about us. Genesis tells us that God is not some power who is far away, but a God who takes interest in this world and in his subjects, those who is created and put in this world. God is highly relational. Read these chapters. God speaks. God shows his involvement in this. And God invites people to participate in his creation. He gives the man and the woman full responsibility and freedom and choice. Genesis tells us that human beings are the very pinnacle of God's creation. It builds as you read this. Man and woman, both created in the image of God. We are not an accident, nor are we bad. After human beings come into being and are given their place, God saw it all and he says, it is very good. Read the creation story, everything else, after, he's cre after it comes to be, he, he puts it in order, it's good. When he gets to humans, it is very good. Human beings are unique from everything else God has made. Man and woman enjoy personal relationship with God. And to be made in God's image means we have dignity and value and responsibility, which is why all Christians should honor dignity in every human being. The story goes on to show how the man and the woman fall away from the relationship that God intended for them to have. This part of the story is important in understanding so many other parts of the Bible, not the least of which is the redemption we have in Jesus Christ. It is because of man and woman's rebellion against the, the Lord that Christ comes to die and restore us to our Father. God's revelation is for us for the purpose of knowing him. Not always to answer all of our questions. I have, and I'll always have many questions about Genesis 1 and 2, but I stand on what I do understand. There are many other parts of Genesis 1 and 2 and 3 that are worth our time, and for such a short few passages, I tell you, this story gets a lot of attention. If you, if you look at most Bible commentaries, which are books that give explanations of the Bible, and you take a Bible commentary on Genesis, about half of the commentary will be dedicated to just these first two or three pages of Genesis, and then the other 47 chapters get about just a little bit of attention. But what I hope this sermon has done for us is that we can read Genesis with new eyes and I believe faithful eyes 
paying attention to what the original intent of these stories might have been, and most of all, learning about our God who is our creator and the one we worship and serve, and who loved us enough to come himself in Christ to reconcile us to himself. Let's pray. Lord, always help us to read the Bible faithfully. Help me to read it and interpret it and preach it faithfully. Help us to move from a childish faith to a mature faith. Help us not to make Genesis an argument, but a story to nurture our understanding of you and how you work in our place with you. We thank you for creating us, for your love for us. We thank you for the beauty and the goodness of this world. And we also understand how we've injured it. So help us to live as you created us to live and honor you for who you are. Amen.